Hello again and thanks for joining us. This week, are the boat people heading for New Zealand and what kind of reception will they get? Well, the government's pushing ahead with law changes to deter mass arrivals by asylum seekers, even though we've never seen one. But the government says the risk is real. New Zealand is now a target for asylum seekers trying to jump the queue, waiting to go through the normal refugee assessment process. So it's about to pass an immigration amendment bill that will sanction up to six months detention for asylum seekers who arrive here in a group of 10 or more. Well, this move stirring up opposition ranging from the New Zealand Human Rights Commission to a coalition of New Zealand's top entertainers. And Selwyn Manning's been exploring the various tensions firing the asylum seekers issue with a former Herald journalist who's been tracking its development closely, Tracy Barnett. Uh, Tracy Barnett, welcome to the program. Thanks, Selwyn. Uh, the the national-led government has initiated legislation that would uh, detain asylum seekers should they arrive via boat to New Zealand in numbers more than 10. Mm. Um, what is it about this legislation that has caused you to campaign against it? <laughs> you know, it's funny, I never really thought about it as a campaign when I started this. I just thought of this as kind of another writing of a column. I think. It's, it's a fairly simple thing. It's, it simply feels like we're breaking something that we've already done right. Uh, in New Zealand, we've always allowed people to wait in the community while their cases are being heard. Their case can take anywhere from several months to several years. Uh, and now, for the first time, we're instituting something that, New Z that Australia has done and had tremendous problems with it, which is detention. Mm. And essentially what this legislation would mean is instituting detention in New Zealand for the first time mm -hmm. and that is a terribly, terribly bad idea. Of course what we're talking about is asylum seekers, um, those people who have arrived at a border right. who are saying we seek refuge in your country um, right. because of these reasons That's um, right. and then they're determined by the authorities as to whether or not they meet the, cr meet the criteria. That's um, right. So what's the status quo at the moment? Can, for a, a person who would arrive in New Zealand um, seeking asylum from us? Well, what happens is you would, all of our asylum seekers arrive by plane. That's a major thing to say, full stop. In New Zealand's modern history anyway, we have never, never had a boat arrival of asylum seekers to our shore, which makes this legislation feel fairly confusing to begin with. We're basically legislating for something that we really haven't experienced yet. Of course, across the Tasman in Australia, it's a different experience. It is a different experience. If, if you were in Australia, how yeah. would you approach it if Australia, and indeed it has, actually uh, advanced legislation in the same way that the National League government is here? Well, they've got it in place. As a matter of fact, they've had it in place for 20 years. Detention has been working in Australia horribly. And what we find in Australia is that uh, people whose cases fall through the cracks or are problematic, and asylum cases are never easy cases. Often there are difficulties in when people have had to run for their lives, they may not have passports and papers and everything else. But what we found is that these detention camps have created um, terrible onsets of, of, of we have women in detention camps, we've had children in detention camps, and we've had people stuck without, retro, without recourse of how to get their cases heard mm. and through and mm. processed through mm. the system. Mm. So to bring that over to these shores seems nonsensical at best mm. when we're a great example of a system that works. Mm. For example, in the world, we're considered, along with places like Belgium and Sweden, people who are doing it correctly. It's not that we're an easy pushover to get into. For, exa for example, we only allow about 300, there's only about 300 applications that come in for asylum a year. Of those, the process is very, very rigorous mm. to prove. And we have a quota with the United Nations of 700 or thereabouts, plus or minus 10, so we're not even meeting half. Yeah? Correct. Um, if, if you're looking at a government and putting yourself in the government's shoes, shoes yeah. one of the things they're saying is, is that the, the government has received intelligence, um, both Labour-led government and the national-led government, sure. over the past 10 years that suggest uh, there were plans for asylum seekers in vessels to actually br travel across the Tasman and reach here. Do you see that from even a point of view of a human rights angle that the government has some sort of mandate to try and prevent people from risking themselves going across that Tasman. We know how dangerous it is. Right. 
There's a few things that are really interesting about this. Um, Nathan Guy appeared recently on television and he talked about that there were, they had intelligence of six boats in the last decade, which is very, very interesting because the proof is in the pudding. Mm. We still have had no boat arrivals, not only this decade, but last decade and the decade before that and the decade before that. We signed something called the 1951 UN Accords. And what those accords were, were after World War II, when many refugees were spilling out all over the world and especially mm. across Europe, mm. They and realized the Second World War. Period, Second World it? War. Sorry, it, they realized that what we needed to do was to define an asylum seeker, so because these people would not have necessarily had the proper papers, and these people shouldn't be thrown back into prison after mm. many of them came out of concentration camps to begin with. That there needed to be a framework in place to make it fair for the asylum seeker. In other words, don't be create an accord that says you can't be thrown in mm. prison, but make it fair for the country to say, let's make sure you're not an economic migrant, for, us, mm. for example. Let's make sure that you have to prove your case. And that's what happens in New Zealand very regularly, mm. Brisley. Of the 300 applications that I just described to you, only about 125 were accepted. Mm. So the process of being approved for asylum is an extremely mm. rigorous process. So let's look at the UN's uh, New Zealand's international obligations to the United Nations a little bit later. First off, sure. though, what I'm trying to do is to test really why the government is advancing this and to test the rationale and really the ethics behind it, perhaps. Um, if, if, once again, you looked at the Tasman as uh, um, once was seen as a, a physical and geographical deterrent to people coming across. And it still is. And still is. The, the Nathan <coughs> Guy on TVNZ's Q&A program on the weekend said, but there's, there's evidence that shows categorically that steel hulled vessels are getting across from Southeast Asia, Central Asia, all the way across to Canada, that New Zealand now is within the radar um, of, of the people who are wanting to transport asylum seekers to our shores, that it's possible. Um, do you kind of acknowledge that that is possible? Sure. It's absolutely been possible. And it's also been possible for anybody to charter a plane and land in the middle of an all backs game. I mean, of course, it's always been possible to come here in any means. Has it been preferable? Hmm. No. It's an expensive proposition to do a steel hull, hull bolt. The boat that he's referring to was the Sun Sea that came to Canada. And that boat was funded by Sri Lankans in Canada. Mm. So that was a hugely expensive proposition. So it was no surprise to Canadian authorities that it was no. on its way then? No, not at all. The boats that we're seeing that are coming into Australia, remember geographically, even though we like to think of ourselves as the center of the universe, the truth is we're in the bottom right-hand corner, surrounded by some very serious mean seas. So is the, is the government at the moment being short of the real facts here when they're not explaining the, con um, the context around these type of things where they're explaining, well, this vessel got to all the way to Canada, that kind of thing could happen here. They're not giving the whole context to it. Are they being well, short with the public on such things? Well, let's put it this way. Here's a great example when perhaps, and I'm just guessing, when Nathan Guy said that we've had intelligence that six different boats have come and had rumor to come. Well, do you remember when the 10 Chinese said that they wanted to come, they were Fulong Gong, I think, said that they wanted to continue from Australia to mm. New Zealand, just, this was fairly recently, and we got word that, ah, maybe mm. somebody is going to try it. Well, we realized that, number one, they didn't have the sailing prowess to come and do such a dangerous voyage without much experience. But number two is that there, the rules that I referred to, this confines of the 1951 convention says that once you land at the first place that has these conventions in place, in this case it was Australia, you can no longer go to another country to claim asylum. Once you get to that first safe haven, which was Australia, they couldn't have come here to claim asylum. We could have rejected them and they knew that. So, 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 so what we saw in fact was the New Zealand government saying, <gasps> They might be coming, but in reality they knew, well, no, we can turn them down for asylum because they're, they're legitimately, they need to claim asylum in Australia. They simply did not have a choice if we follow and pay letter of the law of those conventions, which also means that those conventions state we can't lock people up. And that's what we're looking to do right now, well, which is contravene that. that um, New, Zealand, um, New Zealand's Human Rights Commission, it has stated 
uh, and I quote here, sure. proposed changes to the Immigration Act 2009 threaten New Zealand's obligations under the UN Refugee Convention and potentially lack compliance with the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act 1999. That's right. Now, if we take the New Zealand Human Rights Commission, it should know exactly what it's talking about here. Why is New Zealand's government risking this can of legal worms um, to try and get through something that seems on moral and perhaps ethical and even practical grounds it doesn't need to do? <laughs> what a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, the answer is I don't know, but I can guess. And what the would first, that be? Well, the first question, the first comment that I need to make is that you pointed out something really important, which is when they proposed this law, they sent it out for oral submissions. So everybody in the community could make a comment. What did they get back? Of the 33 submissions back, 32 were against it. We're not talking your average Joe on the street. We're talking the Law Commission was against it. The UNHCR was against it. The Human Rights Commission was against it. We're talking heavy hitters saying, guys, this doesn't make sense. This is contravening our UN Obligations. Obligations. Well, this is Full one stop. of the other things here that I was going to highlight. Um, the, the, under the, the convention, <coughs> New Zealand is obliged to ensure that people who meet the United Nations definition of refugee are granted asylum and not to impose any penalties on the asylum seeker based on their mode of entry to New Zealand. That's so right. once again, here's another layer. Um, I guess why I'm addressing that point too is do you have concerns that the government is going to find amendment and a way around to actually erode some of those principal human rights type of standards that we have there, that's like the Bill of Rights? That's exactly what this is. This is eroding a UN convention that we have honoured for decades upon decades. That's exactly what this bill is doing. Okay, so what has changed in New Zealand? If it, you know, all of us can probably remember uh, the Labour-led government, Helen Clark, um, as, as the leader of that. Sure. Uh, there was a situation in Australia, they were fearful, obviously, of having so many immigrants coming across, boat people, um, asylum seekers trying to actually settle in Australia that they would not be able to sustain the wave of numbers of people. John Howard, the then Prime Minister, um, had uh, leading up to an election, made the Tampa refugee mm -hmm. or asylum seeker, mm -hmm. the Tampa boat, the vessel, a huge issue in that election campaign. Sure. What did New Zealand do? Our leader at that time, Helen Clark, found refuge for members of the Tampa vessel here in New Zealand. Has New Zealand What's society changed, changed mm. so much mm. that we're now so intolerant that our government is now responding to that change? You know, so I, I want to say that I don't believe that. I don't believe that because I'm an optimistic person and I don't believe that because, and I've said this before and I'll say it again quite proudly, mm. I'm a new citizen to yeah, New Zealand. Clearly you're from the United States. I am, yeah. but I made the conscious choice and I had the luxury of making the conscious choice to become a citizen of this country. Yeah, why was that? And I did so partially for many personal reasons, but partially because I believe in the innate fairness of New Zealanders. And I think simply this one has purposely flown under the radar. Most people d have never heard of this bill. Hmm. I think that New Zealanders, when they actually read about what's going on, I think they will find it innately unfair. But, okay, if we look at that fairness thing, it seemed that when the Howard government had ex exhausted itself politically and was sure. tossed out of office by the Rudd government, there was a change of policy relating to this, that there was an element of fairness from their point of view that was put into their own legislation that, it, that took away the Pacific solution um, relating to and asylum hello, it's seekers. all of a sudden back. Mean, yeah, but the people over there, the critics of that move, which right. Uh, was more lenient perhaps or handled it in a more humane, fair way, the, right. the rise of uh, asylum seekers, saw from under Howard the numbers like this go under the Rudd government up very high. So if you go too soft, if you're too fair, do you get a backlash that your society can't actually tolerate? I don't think this has got anything to do with softness. We haven't relaxed any standards. We're not proposing to la relax any standards. The government has made one fatal I hope it's fatal to this bill anyway, mistake. And it's a huge mistake. They haven't done their homework. Their homework, the entire basis of this bill is that if we detain people, it will act as a deterrent. That is simply, absolutely false. And this is the way it's been proven. The studies all over the world 
uh, in the UK at Oxford University, in Canada, University of Toronto, in Australia, La Trobe University, many other studies have proven that detention as a deterrent to asylum seekers simply doesn't work. What happens is that people are at the at the hands of their traffickers and they will go running for their lives they will go wherever their traffickers will take them as long as it's safe and their traffickers sure don't want to dissuade any business so they don't advertise the fact that there's going to be detention of where they're going the research has shown that these asylum seekers have very little if no knowledge of the detention policies in the uh, okay. destination so that country that they're going people. to. Now, desperate people. Tracy, I understand that you, you have witnessed firsthand um, what it's like in detention camps in Australia and, 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 and on the Burma border. Um, yes. So how desperate are people and what kind of conditions do they live in when this type of legislation becomes the norm? Sure. Well, j just recently, a few months ago, I went to Villa Wood in Sydney, which is Sydney's detention centre. And it was an interesting and strange place to be. I interviewed a gentleman there who um, was an, uh, an Iraqi who had made the mistake, or not, I suppose, but in his case, the true mistake of working for the Americans during the war. His father was killed. His story is long and convoluted to tell. But essentially, he ran for his life and got himself to Christmas Island in a boat, one of the small boats that didn't sink, unlike some of the ones that we're seeing today. And uh, at Christmas Island, he was there for about, I think, about a year and a half. The conditions there were terrible, terrible in the sense that um, there are many suicide attempts. There's huge protests of people that are stuck there in limbo. And this isn't just limbo. men. This is women, children. Women, children. Um, he's now, when I interviewed him, it was almost three years he had been in detention. When he was on Christmas Island after a friend had committed suicide, a particularly heart-rending suicide, he and ten other men, uh, people, I'm not sure if they were all men to be honest, uh, sewed their lips together. Mm. And as we were... I remember reporting this in the mid-2000s mm. um, with Australian um, or asylum seekers trying to get into Australia um, being shipped off to Nauru in the camps that Australia had set up there and they'd sewn their lips That's up. Right. So as I sat there speaking to him, I could see the small dots around his lips where the sewing needle had gone. 160 other people joined them in a hunger strike. Um, they protested. It, it, you have to understand that even when I went to Villawood, for example, where he has ended up, um, the entire f opening swaths of the camp had been burned from protests from a year before. People are so frustrated. He, re he re accounted to me that every 15 or 20 days they have suicide attempts, that every night and every morning uh, there's a line that goes from the, ca from the door, mm. out the door, into the down hallway of people waiting for their antidepressants. Yeah, Over half the situation. people are suffering yeah. from post-traumatic st stress. 86% mm. mm. are suffering from depression. Uh, these people are stuck in innocent, when you perceive that you are innocent, with no prison sentence defined in front of you, it's a horrifying place to be in. So those kind of situations, would, would you suggest to the Minister Nathan Guy and perhaps even the Prime Minister that if they want to be informed, they should go and visit these places <laughs> firsthand? I would suggest that 20 years ago, when the Australian authorities first put these camps in place, they may have had the same good, benign intentions that our ministers are claiming to have today. We need to be prepared for a boat arrival, and we need to use this as a deterrent. And look at what's happened. Learn from Australia's mistakes. That's what I su would suggest mm. to them, first and foremost. Okay, so um, many of the viewers may subscribe to the view of that's a terrible situation, but the people are coming from an area that's in the world which is not on our patch, that it's Central Asia and Southeast Asia. Yep, that is Australia's problem, not ours. Right. What situations can you see in the, in the Western Pacific, considering mm -hmm. that the United States uh, often refers to the Western Pacific from Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea, uh, the Melanesian bloc, and mm. across to Polynesia mm, as the arc of instability, mm. where we've already seen, perhaps in Fiji, um, uh, recent coups. Mm -hmm. um, should things go even further awry, there's a possibility, for example, that at least 10 people could venture from Fiji to New Zealand and fall into this category. But more so, perhaps, this whole issue of climate change refugees. 
when right on our doorstep, on our patch, you have Tuvalu and Kiribati and places where there are thousands of people within our lifetime that may seek refuge from an environmental tyranny. Do you see that the national government's uh, legislation mm -hmm. has looked at any of this on our patch? It's kind of a two-tiered question. One, one a little bit I won't buy into, which is, I won't, um, I don't honor fear mongering because there's an, an innate uh, value judgment here that these people are somehow evil and bad instead of people who are simply asking for help. We, you know, after World War II, we were afraid that we would be swamped with boats of Jews. After the Vietnam War, I remember talking to, um, recently I was just talking to Augie, uh, Ozzy Malcolm, who was talking about um, there was always this fear that we would be swamped with Vietnamese and Cambodians in boats. Yes. Um, after 9-11, people talked about us being swamped by terrorists. Well, again, the proof is in the pudding, isn't it? What has happened in each of those cases is that never came to pass. We had one man called Ahmed Zawi who arrived by a plane who was put in solitary confinement for 10 months and after a very costly process was found to be a legitimate mm. refugee. You know, what's really interesting about 9-11, and that's when interdiction came to be, to really clinch so tightly. Interdiction being that people, authorities look at the manifest of airplanes and they see if somebody is going to potentially be an asylum seeker and they take you off the plane to begin with. But what's interesting, before 9-11, far less than 5% of people were ever detained for security reasons. For the two years after 9-11, what happened? Yeah. Our detention rates, and I'm not sure if I have the figure right, I believe was something like 71%. What have they gone back to yeah. right after that? Less than, what, far less than 5% again. So what changed there? I would argue not that we got overrun with terrorists for those two years around 9-11. What changed there was fear, political fear, not the actuality of people who well, needed let's, help. Let's look again at the realities within our patch. Perhaps it could be successfully argued, con yeah. considering the advance of global warming at the moment sure. that is being acknowledged and the right. polar areas That's melting right. at faster rates than we ever anticipated. Are we going to be overrun with climate change? That, yeah, but Asylum also figures. from the point of view, do we as New Zealanders, right. New Zealanders have right. a moral obligation to those within our region who are going to be seeking refuge via one sure. way or another, even though they're not legally defined as being able to apply for refugee status at the moment? I, I think that that question is almost a different question. And the reason why I think of it is that I suspect what will happen is that that kind of solution will be talked about in a Pacific Island or Pacific Forum kind of setting. Those are bigger solutions than somebody deciding that we're going to use detention for a boatload over 10. Because I think that when we start, if that was the case, if, if an island sank underwater and we knew that we had X amount of people that we had to service, I think what would happen is that all the island nations of the region would get together and decide on what is the best solution of helping these people. So it comes back to a two pronged thing here. That situation of environmental asylum seeking uh, is a potential reality within our lifetimes. But in numbers, what the government is proposing that we should be fearful of with an, an influx of people coming from the Southeast Asia or Central Asia bloc is actually a fallacy and it just won't happen. You know, so and I think what's really going on here, and this is perhaps the question that I didn't get to answer earlier, this is about getting on the same political page without any political risk to our government. There's nobody, there's few people in this country besides the people who directly deal with refugees um, and there's such a small group, as you can tell, mm. they're that are going to yell and scream and go to bat for 300 people or 125 people. The government knows, you know what, people aren't going to really make us think about this and we can earn some political points with Australia we, by being on the same page as they are. We can earn some political points with Canada who have a very, very conservative immigration minister. Because this, this, this idea actually rings a bell. Um, Nathan Guy on te Television New Zealand on the weekend actually made mention of the Five Eyes Network 
um, which is Britain, Canada, the United States, New Zealand and Australia, and that's where the intelligence relating to boat people and asylum seekers was coming from. So you're saying that it does look like they're, they're trying to find a common ground to that's fit in, not be the weak link in a particular. That's right. This is political point gathering and, and saying stand tall with this group, even though this group in the case of Australia, has made a terrible mistake, and we're actually trying to echo okay. it. For the viewers out there, if they're compelled to want to get more informed yeah. or to get involved with this issue, whichever side that they fit on, how can they go about that? What a wonderful question. Um, I produced a video called We Are Better Than That. Look, at, look for it on YouTube. You have to look for it. We are better than that New Zealand. But also, most importantly, it looks like the middle parties are going to be the people who define this issue. That means Peter Dunn, the Maori Party, uh, Winston Peters, write to them directly. Tell them how you feel. Tell them if you feel, as I do, this isn't fair. Pass it along. Tracy Barnett, thank you very much. So we're Manning with journalist Tracy Barnett. And that's all for now. We're back in a week with more news breakers and newsmakers on the Beats and Interview. Until then, thanks for your company. See you next time. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.